Hello, and welcome to Vavork. I'm Brian Watrous. This is the sixth in a 10-part video series in which I'm teaching you how to automate using the Realize Orchestrator. In this video, we're going to take a look at how to create a, an orchestrator workflow. This time, it's going to be a workflow that has an input parameter. So let's take a look in the demo environment. As you can see, I'm logged into the VRO client. If you don't know how to do that, go back to video number three. But here in the VRO client, I'm in design view. I've clicked the workflows tab, and you can see the workflow, the hello world workflow that we created a couple of videos ago. Now we're going to again create another hello world workflow, a little variation on it this time. The new version is going to be very similar to the previous version. So I'm going to begin by duplicating the first hello world. So let's take a look here at how you do that. So you select the workflow, not the token, but the workflow, right click it and simply choose duplicate workflow. When you do so, a window pops up and in that window, you can change the name of the workflow if you want. So by default, it's called copy of whatever the original workflow was. Uh, I'm going to call this hello world two. And in here, I can specify which folder I want the copy placed into. By default, it's going to land in the same folder where the original came from. And I can say whether or not I want to keep the version history. That's the version numbering, which uh, you can see in the general tab. I'm going to go ahead and keep that version history and click submit. And as you can see over here on the left side, I now have a new workflow called Hello World 2. And what's going to be different about this workflow is instead of always saying hello world, we're going to modify this workflow so that whenever a user runs this workflow, it'll ask the user for their name. And instead of saying hello world, it's going to say hello followed by their name. Now, again, this is not a terribly exciting workflow, but it is good to illustrate the concept of input parameters. Input parameters allow us to receive information from the user that's calling our workflow. Or as I pointed out in earlier videos, it may not be a, a, a user, a human being calling your workflow. It could be an, an external system or the workflow scheduler. But whoever or whatever is calling our workflow, we can get information from the caller by creating something called an input parameter. Now, input parameters are actually pretty easy to create. create. To, to do so, I'm going to start editing my workflow. I'll click the edit button. And in here, if I want to create input parameters, I'll simply go to the inputs tab. Now, uh, later on, we'll be talking about output parameters. The output parameters tab is where we would go to create those. But for our workflow right now, all we need is an input parameter. So we'll click on the inputs tab. And as you can see here, currently this area is blank because we have no input parameters. To create an input parameter, I'm going to click on the add button. And each time I do so, a new line gets entered. So this line is actually an input parameter. But as you can see, it starts off with a default name that's not very useful. We want to name our input parameter variable uh, to suggest what it does. So I'm going to call this variable, let's see, why don't we call it name, since it's going to ask the person for their name, and it's going to store that name. To change the name, you simply click on the existing name. This name is a link. Just click on it. A window will pop up, and in that window, you can change the name of the variable to whatever you want within the bounds of uh, legal and characters for variables as according to the rules of JavaScript. So I'm going to create a variable called name. That's a valid name in JavaScript, and I'll click the OK button. Now, for this particular input parameter, the default type of string is exactly what I want. I want a string of characters that the user can type their name into. Over here, we have one of those description fields, which, as you know from previous videos, we always fill out descriptions. And in this case, it's actually very important because the description that we put here is what's going to be used to prompt the user for this information. So I'm going to ask the user for his or her name. So I'll say, what is your name? So now I have a single input parameter. Now, I'm not really done here, but I want to show you with what we have so far what, what we've got. So I'm going to go over to the schema tab. And even though I haven't actually uh, used that 
that new input parameter variable anywhere, uh, we will here shortly. I'd like to go ahead and click on this run button to show you what we have. Again, all we've done is we've created one input parameter. We haven't written any code, just one input parameter. And when we run the workflow, you'll notice that a window pops up and it asks us to supply a value for the input parameter we specified. Again, this part here is the, the description we typed a few moments ago. So I could type my name and we could submit this workflow. I know it's not going to do anything though because I don't have any place in this workflow where I'm using that input parameter. But I could. The point here, the reason why I'm running this already is to point out that in order to ask users questions, we simply create input parameters. And you don't have to write any code because Orchestrator will create the input screen for you. All right, so I'm going to actually cancel and continue editing our workflow. Now, in our workflow, we want to be able to access this new input parameter called name in this schema element. But there's one very important thing to understand, which is that no schema elements see my input parameter. Not yet, anyways. When you create an input parameter, it's not visible, it's not accessible by any schema element. So this schema element doesn't see it, this schema element doesn't see it, even this schema element sees it. No input parameters are seen by any schema elements until we do something special. And furthermore, that's true not just of input parameters, it's also true of output parameters, and another type of variable we talked about briefly before called attributes. Attributes are created on the general tab. So even though we currently have an input parameter called name, none of the schema elements that you see here can see it. So what we need to do here is to set up something known as parameter binding. And the way we're going to do that, there, there's actually multiple techniques to do it, but in this particular case, I'm going to show you one of the techniques. What we're going to do is edit the schema element that we want to see the input parameter. So this say hello world, I want it to be able to see the input parameter. So we'll edit this schema element by clicking on the pencil icon. And in the window that pops up, there's a number of different tabs, including one labeled in. Now we're going to come back to that one in a moment, but let's go over to the scripting tab for just a few moments. Is there something I want to illustrate here? Uh, ultimately, we don't want our code to say hello world anymore. We want the logging message to say hello, followed by the name input parameter. So that when we run this workload, it'll say hello, Brian, or things like that. Now, the reason why I'm doing this in advance of doing the parameter binding and going to the end tab to do that, the reason why I'm doing this is I'd like you to take note of what color this variable is here. It's black. That'll be important later on. But let's actually go set up the input, uh, excuse me, let's go set up the parameter binding to that input parameter. So I'll click on the end button, or I should say the end tab. And on the end tab, you can see here all of the input parameters, output parameters, and attributes that are accessible by the schema element, which if you look real closely is completely blank. There are no variables of any sort accessible to the schema element. So what I'm going to do is click on this binding button, kind of looks like a little barbell. We're going to click on that binding button and a window pops up that gives us a choice, in this case, just one choice, but this would ordinarily give us a choice of all of the variables, whether they were input parameters or some other type of variable. This would be a list of all the variables to which we could uh, do parameter binding. Now, in this case, I want to uh, grab a hold of this name input parameter that we created before. Remember that was that string input parameter that we created before? We're just going to check its checkbox and click select. And as you can see here, the screen has changed a bit. This was blank before, but now this in tab is telling us that this schema element can see a variable called name that variable that you see here in the local parameter column is the name of the variable as it's known inside this schema element. There's now a variable in here called name.
that name variable that's in the schema element has been bound to our input parameter called name. Now in this case, the two variables, the variable inside the schema element and the variable inside my workflow are identical in terms of their name. They're both called name, uh, but that's not a strict requirement. You can have two different variables, your variable in your workflow and their variable in their schema element. Uh, you can have different names there. They don't have to match. The type of the variable that we just bound our new local variable to is a string and it has that their description. So notice now when we go back to the scripting tab, that something's a little different. Uh, you'll recall a few moments ago, I asked you to remember what color this variable was. And as you recall, it was black. Now that I've set up parameter binding to this variable, the editor has color coded the variable to let me know that this is a bound variable. So this variable called name is bound. Another way I can tell it's bound is over here in this section, we can see uh, all the variables that we've set up an inward binding to. So there's that name variable. Now I'm going to show you a little trick here that it's probably not that important in this particular case because the variable name is so simple, but later on this will come in really handy. Uh, if you're like me and you're not the greatest typist in the world, uh, you might accidentally make a typo such as I just did. Or maybe you're not so uh, bad at typing in terms of the accuracy, but maybe Maybe you're just really, really slow. Uh, either way, instead of typing the variables, you can instead insert your cursor where you want the variable. And you may have noticed the, the little underlined flashing here. Over here, if I click on the variable name and hit in, and, and if I click on the variable name, over in my code, that variable gets inserted. And because I'm inserting it by clicking on it, it's very fast to insert the variable name and it's going to be spelled correctly every single time. Now you don't have to use this click on variable technique, but it actually tends to be a good idea to, to do that in the beginning as an orchestrator developer. You can, you can do that for your whole entire orchestrator developer career, but in the beginning it's really useful to do that because if you start forcing yourself to click on the name instead of typing the variable, then that way you will know that you're always going to spell the variables correctly. And furthermore, if you ever came over here to click on a variable name and didn't see it, then that would be an indication that you hadn't done the parameter binding that's probably necessary. So I'm going to once again click on name and then I'll click close. We'll then validate the workflow. And as you can see, the validator is happy with this workflow. Now we can either click on the run button to test this out, but I may as well save this workflow. So I'm going to do a save and close and run the workflow, not here in the editor, but back on the, on the main screen. By the way, I can always tell when I'm on the main screen because it's the one that has this blue background. So we have this new workflow called Hello World 2. It has a single input parameter called name that gets used in the schema, in particular in this schema element, to send a message to the screen. There's my code. Uh, the message being hello, comma, and then whatever the person's name is. Actually, if you're listening closely there, you just caught me. It's uh, system.logs not intended to send the message to the screen, but rather to a log file. The Vero client is just kind enough to show us the message on the screen. All right, so I have this new workflow and I'll select it. I'll click the start button. And again, we've got one input parameter here. So I'm gonna type my name and I'll click the submit button. As you can see, the workflow starts running. It runs very quickly. And if we go check the logs tab, let me grab this resize handle so I can see the logs tab. If we go click on the logs tab, we can see that the message now, instead of saying hello, comma, world, it now has a much more personalized message. It says, hello, Brian Watrous. And if I run this workflow again, isn't going to be terribly exciting, but if I run the workflow again and put in someone else's name, like 
uh, Bozo the Clown. Oh, if only I could type Bozo the Clown and run the workflow. As I'm sure you've already figured out, the message that gets logged is now going to say, hello, Bozo the Clown. So there you have it. That's how you create an input parameter. And furthermore, so remember we went to the inputs tab to create the input parameter. And then when we went to the schema tab, we set up binding to that variable by editing a schema element and going to its end tab. Now you can use the same techniques essentially to create output parameters and bind to them. Again, you can go to the outputs tab to create an output parameter and then go to any schema element that you want to be able to access that output parameter. And instead of, let me click there again, instead of clicking on the in tab, since it's an output parameter, you would go to the out tab. But otherwise the process here is essentially the same. All right, so that's it for the demo. Uh, do come back and watch the next video. Let's see, this is video number six. So the next video is video number seven. And in there, what we're going to be talking about is parameter binding, which we've been talking about here in this video. But you'll really, really, really want to go watch video seven about parameter binding because parameter binding is the, uh, in my experience, teaching hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of orchestrator students, par parameter binding is the biggest conceptual hurdle for new orchestrator developers to master. So make certain you join me over in video number seven and, and let's talk about parameter binding. Thanks.